Welcome back everyone to another review by Fat Ninja Studios. I'm your host Jackie Kay and today we are blessed with the eyes of Tammy Faye, an extravagant biopic about the late Tammy Faye and her husband Jim Baker as they rose to stardom in televangelical circles and came crashing right back down. Before we dive in, please give this video a like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget to shine that bell icon to stay up to date with our latest releases. Spoiler warning ahead. The film begins with a mixture of real news broadcasts of the whole Jim and Tammy Faye Baker scandals, intercut with an unrecognizable Jessica Chastain in full-on Tammy Faye makeup. She looks god awful, caked with too much makeup and too much hairspray, getting ready to do a television interview. We then cut back to 1952, International Falls, Minnesota, with a young Tammy Faye heading off to church. A typical southern style sermon is going on, with lots of shouting about being loved by God if you love him. Real snake pit preacher type stuff even including a woman violently shaking herself like she's having an epileptic fit as the spirit of Jesus takes hold of her. Tammy's mother plays the church piano, but she can't bring Tammy inside because she had her out of wedlock. But Tammy is on a mission to be saved and live the good Christian life. She decides to make a stand by walking into that church the very next Sunday. She pretends to freak out and do the same seizure bullshit as if the Holy Ghost came down on her and started using her body as a wrestling ragdoll. This excites the preacher who exclaims, She's finally saved! We cut to 1960, to the North Central Bible College in Minneapolis, where Jim Baker is about to address a room full of people on his ideas of preaching in the modern day. Most people don't take him seriously, except of course Tammy Faye, who is instantly smitten with him. They have some weird pseudo-sexual proverbs exchanged before getting together for lunch. He reveals he wants to be a preacher because he almost killed someone while drunk driving and that he used to want to be a rock star. After a little song and dance, they head back to his dorm and begin having sex. Like a week or two later, they're married and she brings him home to meet her family. Her mom isn't so convinced that he isn't some shyster, especially since Tammy Faye apparently has a history of falling in love and getting used by a bunch of boys. But Tammy swears it's God's plan and they're gonna do great things. The following weeks, Tammy begins an interest in making puppets and thinks that she could use them to teach the Bible to young kids, while Jim blows a bunch of money on a car. They take their Bible puppet show on the road, hitting different chapels, and begin to make a name for themselves. One night, while in a hotel, Tammy wants to make love and notices that Jim isn't about it lately, but is suddenly transfixed by a commercial for Reverend Pat Robertson, an early televangelist looking to raise money for his church. Jim hasn't been paying off the car though, so it was repossessed, and either by luck or the grace of God, they meet the television manager of Pat Robertson. We jump to 1969 at CBN headquarters in Virginia Beach, where Tammy and Jim's puppet show has been growing an audience for a few years. But while it seems that Tammy is happy and her dreams have come true, Jim is secretly trying to get more, mostly for himself. During her segment, he announces his own new show, The 700 Club. She has her own surprise though, as she's pregnant. A few months go by, the 700 Club has taken off, and it keeps Jim busy every night. Think the late show circuit, but with lots of Bible verses. Tammy calls up her mom just to talk and mentions that Jim and her don't have sex or anything. Like, he's not interested in her anymore. She then brings up Jim's show, but her mom dismisses it as if it's immaterial. However, secretly, she and her husband stay up every night to watch it. Tammy prays that night that she's going to do more on TV to help everyone in the world. 
We then slide into 1971 at the Robertson Estate in Hot Springs, Virginia, which has acres of land and huge swimming pool, a manicured lawn, and all the bells and whistles. It's a hot summer day and Robertson's wife is walking around greeting the guests in a brand new mink fur coat. Robertson corners Jim and tries to convince Jim to take time off to be with his family while he would generously step in and host the 700 Club for a little while. At this point, Robertson has basically been cashing in on 85% of the earnings, and Jim knows this, and it angers him. Bring in Reverend Jerry Falwell Sr., host of the Old Time Gospel Hour and representing the Thomas Road Baptist Mega Church. He is old school, but he still believes in money and power, singing Bible verses like a machete in a switchblade knife fight. He basically spends the entire dinner condescending to Tammy Faye about her ideas, and Jim kind of allows it. He is also staunchly against liberalism, feminism, and homosexuality, as he views these all as major opponents to what the Bible teaches. Tammy, however, thinks everyone deserves to be saved by the word of God. Jim and Tammy host a Christmas special, bringing in big music guest stars from all over America, which serves as the biggest promotional event for their own network, PTL Studios in Charlotte, North Carolina. Tammy Faye Baker even makes her own stamp in the recording world, releasing a few faith-based albums by 1977, including a hit single, We Are Blessed. PTL pulls in hundreds of thousands of dollars through their pledges and even creates a charity called PTL Around the World to donate directly to missionaries and other such things. In 1978, PTL was worth millions, and they built their own complex called the Heritage Village Church, becoming the fourth largest television network in the nation at the time. In 1980, Tammy Faye has her own talk show, where she interviews unique guests, like an erectile dysfunction specialist, who designed the penis pump. Trying to address a vast array of both medical and mental health issues, as well as social stigmas, by also interviewing homosexual persons affected by the AIDS epidemic. This makes her mother, as well as powerful people in the religious circuit, like Reverend Falwell, extremely unhappy and embarrassed. Jim and Tammy Faye now reside in a deluxe mansion, and they're rich with fancy imported clothes, jewelry, and expensive trinkets galore. But Tammy also begins to look a little rough around the edges, slowly morphing into layers of makeup and gaudy jewelry and fake tans to cover up the age wrinkles and stress marks. While Jim can't deny the growth of their network, and a huge part of that being indebted to his wife, Tammy Faye, he is also beginning to feel the pressure of the powerful players and feels a constant war with himself if he should try to tame his wife or let her carry on as is. He's also hiding the fact that they're in some serious debt because Jim has never been good at paying the bills on time. He still also doesn't show interest in his wife sexually, and that's mostly because he's secretly homosexual himself, having an affair with quite a few of the male staff members. This causes Tammy Faye to have her own affair with her music producer, Gary Paxton. The media then begin attacking the Baker family about not paying their taxes, living a life of excess, all while claiming to be regular middle class preachers trying to spread the word of God. And they launch their own counter campaign by asking for even more pledges. Tammy gets pregnant with her second child and Jim accuses her of having the affair with Gary and says that he can't be sure if the child's even his. But if she wants to save the marriage, she will have to publicly apologize for her transgressions on their network and basically retire her talk show. She's put on all sorts of medications, from weight loss pills to anti-anxiety meds. She openly flirts with the PTL Building Foundation construction manager, so he'll continue to build houses for PTL without any insurance that PTL will even have the funds to pay for it all. And even President Reagan becomes a pledge.
Through his connections to the White House, PTO is granted tax-exempt status, which the media drags out as a pyramid scheme, demanding justice. In 1985, at the Heritage USA site in Fort Mill, South Carolina, Jim meets with Reverend Farwell about building another giant megachurch, which he dubs the PTL Coliseum, to host their own Christian rock concerts and other live events. Of course, Jerry thinks it's an obnoxious and ostentatious display and chides Jim for it, but then he gets to the real meat of his visit. Apparently, he and the organization have their sticky fingers deep in the presidential election, and as Reagan begins to step down to keep their values going, they need to stand behind George Bush Sr. Jim's friend and old partner, Pat Robinson, also wants to be president and has been putting his own campaign together. But Jerry reminds Jim that they need a strong candidate who wants to keep good Christian values and who will fight against the immorality spreading through the immigrants and, as he dubs it, the gay cancer ravaging the nation. At this point, PTL has its own satellite, boosting their numbers to 20 million viewers a day. This makes it the most valuable weapon in the religious organization arsenal. However, Tammy Faye is still out there doing her thing, and it makes the powers feel Jim's leadership is problematic and maybe a change of ownership would be ideal, or just to get rid of PTO altogether. So suddenly, Jim's affairs are leaked to the press, and the media eat it up like a frenzy. Tabloids everywhere are plastered with Jim's face, calling him an adulterer or worse. At this point, Tammy Faye's world is on fire, and she takes more and more medications, putting her in a disoriented and oblivious state most of the time, until one night when she mixes too many and ODs. She's rushed to the hospital and informed that she has an addiction problem, and decides to tackle it cold turkey, jokingly stating that from now on, her drug of choice will be Diet Coke. A few days later, Jim and Tammy have an epic spat where they bear all, their hostile feelings towards each other, and Jim finally comes clean to her about his affairs, including a woman he paid off to keep quiet by using money directly from the PTL fund. And who else but good old Reverend Jerry Falwell steps in to help unburden Jim and fix this crisis. Falwell holds a press conference where he basically hangs Jim out to dry and demotes them from running the foundation to being basically excommunicated. Tammy and Jim go on a media circus run trying to recover their image and also explain away all the money fraud claims. But Jim is inevitably hauled into court and found guilty of embezzling over $92 million. Eventually, Jim is put in a federal penitentiary, and Tammy Faye tries to save face by holding a few press conferences of her own, saying that she stands by her man. But ultimately, her fall from grace is complete. We jump to 1994. Tammy Faye is living in a small two-bedroom house trying to recover her career in the spotlight by applying as a kid's show host in Hollywood. She lives an otherwise quiet and unremarkable life until she's called to sing at a church as a special guest. She goes to visit her husband in San Bernardino, and he encourages her to take the gig. Meanwhile, her mother dies, leaving Tammy Faye completely alone, estranged from her own children even. We pick back up with Tammy Faye getting ready to do her live performance putting on her thick makeup and wigs, and as she goes out to sing, she begins to imagine the crowd becoming uproarious and that her fame rises back into the stars. The film begins to wrap up, showing what happened to the major players involved. Jerry Falwell failed to save PTL and then died in 2007. Pat Robertson returned to hosting the 700 Club, which he still does to this day. Jim was eventually released from prison and started a new PTL network. And Tammy Faye renewed her efforts by trying to spread God's word and embrace the homosexual community until her death in 2007. 
All in all, the film was pretty terrific. Not as glitzy or stylized like I, Tanya or Wolf of Wall Street, but it does glamorize a couple whose fall from grace hits so hard you almost feel hurt by it. Jessica Chastain does an absolutely stunning job as Tammy Faye, literally sinking into her character under pounds of caked on makeup and fake forced smiles. Andrew Garfield feels adequate in the role of Jim Baker, lacking a bit of the charisma and charm of the real Jim, but overall he's a little man preaching the money out of people's pockets. It's kind of harrowing to know that he is actually still alive today, on the new PTL network, still trying to sucker people out of their hard-earned dollars. Tammy Faye sadly passed away in 2007, but the film does a beautiful job of giving her a glorious send-off befitting a fame-hungry starlet. If you're a fan of watching people at the top come tumbling down, then this is a car crash you don't want to miss. I give the film a solid 7 out of 10. There are moments where the film did drag on, and that can't be helped, as before they began their journey on PTO, they were a rather ordinary couple, if a bit delusional. The film does a fantastic job of overblowing the whole Christian organization, showing the differences between the folks who just believe in something versus those who are in control of what they believe and use it to benefit themselves. It also addresses the church versus the LGBT community, and while it paints her as some saint rallying against the Christian oppressors, the rest of it is handled pretty realistically. I want to thank you all for checking out the video. Please give it a like, share, and subscribe to our channel. If you want to reach out to us, you can do so on Twitter at StudiosFat, or find us on Discord, linked below in the description. We also have a Patreon, so please check that out, also linked below. I've been your host, Jackie Kay, and before I go, having faith can be a great thing. It doesn't matter what you have faith in, from whatever deity you worship to even just having faith in yourself. Just be wary of people who would use that faith to manipulate you. Don't let yourself be taken for granted. A smile and a handshake is easier to fake than actually helping in a cause, so make sure to always do your research. Thank you all, and as always, take care.